We are blessed. Um, I just met these guys this morning. They were hanging out out front, and I said, hey, since you guys got some band equipment, why don't y'all come in and play music for us? And, and I'm glad they did, aren't you? They, uh, you guys are from Chatsworth, right? Chattanooga, Tennessee. Okay, farther northwest than we are. And uh, they are eight days after, and, and just before we got, get into this, I want to let you know they didn't make any money coming here. They did it because they love Jesus Christ, and they want to worship him. But it cost them something to come here. And the little bit we give them does not cover what they have brought in their time and their expense. So they have some CDs and some stuff out there. Please, please, please support them. Go buy, buy all their CDs. Don't let's, let's not let a CD be left when they leave here today and the other stuff. Okay, that would be a great blessing to them. But I believe in the future, hopefully, we'll be able to have them come back. And we're, we have plans to do outreach. We've already talked about the trunk or treat. We have nine acres out here. I would love to see us set up an outdoor concert out here on our property, have these guys come back, and maybe a couple other groups. Wouldn't that be awesome? The message that I have for you this morning uh, honestly doesn't have a title because I wasn't sure how to title it. And it's going to be mostly for church folks. You guys that are followers of Christ, you, are, you would say, yes, I'm all in with Jesus. Uh, live for him, serve him, want to be like him, want to be in his will and do what he wants me to do. But I also believe that for all of you, if, if that's not, not you, that that this message will be for you this morning as well. And uh, I have some questions for you, and I, I know the answer already, but I'll, I'll need you to talk back to me this morning a little bit, okay? Um, is there anything in your life that you wish would change? Is there anybody, family members, friends, um, loved ones that you have, that you just pray and wish, you know, hopefully prayerfully that, that God would get a hold of them and change their lives? Yes. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you another question. What if in the next six weeks, not just here, but all around us in our, our circles of influence, we saw 25 salvations? What if we saw 50 new believers baptized for Jesus Christ? What if in this church we saw a 20% increase in church attendance? What if we saw 20 new people serving in ministry, accepting a call to ministry? What if we had two new people accept their call to missions and two new local small groups start? What would you call that? A revival. An awakening, possibly. Wouldn't that be awesome in six weeks to see 25 salvations? Well, let me ask you this. How do you think that's going to happen? And do you think that can happen? Yes. Yes. Right. It can happen. Amen. It can happen. But it's going to require something of you and me. We can't do what we've been doing and expect different results. You've probably heard that before. The definition of insanity is doing the same old thing, expecting different results. And we can't just do the same old thing. We've got to dig deeper. Amen. We've got to seek God more. We've got to be willing to give of our time and our resources and, and, and our effort to see these things happen. God can do it, and God will do it. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we can save anybody. We can't save nobody. We can't save anybody for you English teachers. We can't save ourselves. Self-help is the biggest lie in the world. It amazes me, the people that go to stores and buy self-help books, thinking, listen, I'm the problem in the first place. Me helping myself is what got myself in the shape I was in. And that's why God had to pull me out of that pit of slime, that muck and that mire, that slimy pit. God had to pull me out because I put myself there. And many of you have too. And so self-help is just ridiculous. We need God's help. We need His presence. We need His help alone. And I love the scripture. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures today. Um, but I want to tell you, we've talked a little bit lately. If, if you haven't kind of kept up with the church, we've been talking about church and, you know, why people stayed away from church, why they should come back to church, what our job as 
followers of Christ are, and, and we've been using the word invest a lot, that we need to invest, not just spend, but invest financially, but we need to invest our time. We need to invest our, our talents that God's given us. We need to invest our, our energy and all of our resources. And when we invest, what do we expect? A return. When you invest financially, you expect a return, or you don't invest. And that's the same. And we believe that as we invest our time and our prayers and our, our effort and even our money, that we will see a return for the kingdom. It's not for us. It's not for this church. And you guys that have been here before, we, we beat this drum a lot. This, what we're doing is not just for us. We're, we're just a small little tiny part of what God wants to do in our world. We're infinitesimal. We're, we're just nothing in what God wants to do because God is so much bigger than we could ever imagine. Not just in Pickens County and in, in northwest Georgia, but in Tennessee and North Carolina, across the country and across the world. God is everywhere. He's the creator of the universe. You know that, right? He's still creating, by the way. Scientists have discovered that there are still planets and stars and galaxies being formed one after another. God is, a, is a, just an unbelievable creator, and he's still creating, and he's still changing lives, and he can still change lives today. I want to read some promises to you from God and, and, and the principle of sowing and reaping and investing in return. When you invest, you expect a return. When you sow, you reap, right? God says, whatever you sow, you shall reap, good or bad. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, God says, but if, notice the if, from there you seek the Lord your God, you will, notice the will, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. If you look for him, he says, you'll find me. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then is an important word, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Psalm 81.13 and 14 says, If my people would but listen to me, if Israel would follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes? Jeremiah 15, 19 says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says, If you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. Those are great promises from God, but it requires something from us. He says, If you repent... I'll restore you, not might, not later. I won't think about it. It's done. If you repent, I restore you right then. If my people will pray, then I'll come and heal their land. We've, we've so neglected prayer. And honestly, even in this church, and, and we pray, you know, we pray on before service, during service, after service. We pray before meetings. We pray before meals. We have a prayer team that will pray with you. But I'm telling you, in the next little while, we're going to ramp up the prayer in our church because we need to seek God. And when we do, he says, you're going to find me and I'm going to heal your land. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that a great promise from God? He doesn't even waver on the possibility of it. He says, if you do, I'll do it. I love history. I love uh, church history. I love all kinds of history, but I love reading about church history, even the bad, because I think we can learn from the bad, you know, Granted, church has done a lot of bad. bad. You know, Christians have killed other people in the name of Christianity. And, and you just got to think that that just breaks God's heart. But, but I, I love to read about history. And I love to read about old revivals. I don't know if any of you guys do. But I want to mention some revivals here. I got a, a kind of a page of historical revivals. Um, the Reformation. This was back in the 16th century. This is where, where really most of our churches were born from. Our Protestant churches. You know, they were, they were protesting which is where the word Protestant came from. We were protesting the Catholic Church because they were doing some stuff they shouldn't be doing. They were basically selling indulgences, they called them, which meant, you know, if you've sinned, you pay me money, I'll pray for you, and God will think about absolving your sin. And so it was just terribly corrupt. And so that's where the, the Protestant Reformation came from. Martin Luther, uh, great, great history. You should read it. Uh, the Great Awakening happened in the uh, 1700s. Second Great Awakening happened in the 1800s. 
Um, we're going to talk more about some of these things. Azusa Street and the Pentecostal Revival, where a lot of our churches kind of had their, their birth and the charismatic movement in the 1960s. Uh, some of you guys remember that. Some of you guys are old enough to remember that charismatic movement. I was just a little baby uh, at that time. The third wave, uh, which is actually a, a just another part of the charismatic movement. And then the Toronto Blessing. Too bad Eileen's not here. She would probably be able to fill us in a little more on that. Uh, what happened in Toronto, Canada. Just amazing outpouring of God's blessing up there. And then the Brownsville Revival. Many of you know about the Brownsville Revival in Florida. And it's out, honestly still going on and, and it's crazy. Uh, the millions, millions of people have traveled to the Brownsville Revival to, over the years to just be a part of what God was doing down there. Just to see what God was doing. Here's the point. I believe, I believe we can be a part of the next revival that will be mentioned in history. I honestly believe that we can be a part, my opinion, I've told you, I'll tell you it's my opinion. My opinion, I think we can be a part of the last revival, which is going to mammothly outweigh all the other, other revivals. The other revivals will look like child's play compared to the last revival, according to what God says. And again, I want to talk to you more about some of these revivals in the next coming weeks. Um, the first Great Awakening w uh, involved some really well-known, uh, famous dead guys, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. Some of you guys have heard of Whitfield County in Georgia. That's where uh, the name came from. Jonathan Edwards was an amazing, amazing preacher, young guy, 13 years old. He is a child prodigy at Yale University. Graduated at the top of his class at 17 from Yale University. And it's said that Jonathan Edwards prayed and studied his Bible over 13 hours a day. 13 hours a day while being a teenager at Yale, Yale University. You think he was committed? You think he was committed to the Lord? How many of us study the Bible 1.3 hours a day, much less 13 hours a day? Just an amazing thing. And then George Whitfield came over and actually landed in Georgia and led revivals all the way up the East Coast, North Carolina, uh, North New York, sorry, New York, uh, Philadelphia, and all the way back and forth to Georgia back in the 1730s. And it's amazing some of the things that happened. Uh, Jonathan Edwards lived in a town in Massachusetts called Northampton when the Great Awakening happened. And it's said that people were saying it was like one day God invaded the town. And that the entire town was full of God's presence. And that if you met someone who was spiritually indifferent to God, it seemed like a weird, strange thing. That people would be talking about how, gosh, there's somebody that's not on fire for God. It, like it was a strange thing. Now look at us. It's a strange thing if you find somebody on fire for God. Because most of the world, even in the churches, are very indifferent to God. But listen... Isn't there something deep, maybe deep down inside of you that kind of craves that? To be a part of something that when God shows up, it's like he shows up everywhere. Think about the cowboy church and Mount Zion Baptist Church. And we have, we have the cowboy church with us today. Think about everywhere where Jesus is worship. What if the revival breaks out and suddenly Channel 5 News shows up? And they go, something is happening in Pickens County. People are leaving the bars, the, the, and, and they're just going back home and coming back to their families. And, and people are leading Bible studies in their home. And, and they're, they're have, just right in the middle of the street and in the high school, in the middle school, the elementary schools, the kids are just stopping and praying in the middle of the hallways and witnessing to each other and worshiping together. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, come on. You hand me my water. Wouldn't, wouldn't that just be awesome to think that God could do that here? What's your first thought when you hear me talk about that? It's impossible. Maybe. I hope not. But some of you maybe are thinking, that's yeah, a nice thought, Mark, but how's that going to happen? Do you even watch the news? I mean, we're going in the other direction. It's just like the world is going way far away from God. Can I tell you that in these revivals, it really wasn't any different. 
There's nothing new under the sun. Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. There's always been sin. There's always been morally wicked people. And there still is. But we're minimizing God if we think He can't do that or greater. We are minimizing Him if we think He can't do that or even greater. And that's my prayer. And that's, listen, our leadership got together this week. I got a lot of our prayer team together. We had a meeting in here, and I kind of unveiled to them what we're going to do and talk about for the next six weeks. And listen, we're on the same page. We believe that God can and will do it if we seek Him. We just are crazy enough to think that He will fulfill His promises. That when we seek Him, He will be found by us. And He will change our world. And listen, this is not just for us. We've got other churches represented here. I, I didn't ask for permission, so I won't call everybody out. But we've got other folks that are, that are committed and serving in other churches that are here this morning. We're praying for all of you too. And believing that it's going to happen not just in this place, but all around our area. I believe it. Throughout Scripture, 40 is a very key word. It's a, it's a key number in days and years. The, the typical happening when you read in Scripture about 40 days or 40 years, and, and I challenge you to go back and read, it's typically a time of testing or even discipline, sometimes punishment for God's people that have turned away from Him. Sometimes it's just God testing them to see, are you for real? Are you really committed to me like you say you are? I want to read you some of these Scriptures. Genesis chapter 7, verse 12 says, And rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. Um, Acts chapter 7, verse 30 talks about when Moses fled Egypt. Um, it says that after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. Exodus 24, 18 says, Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. This was where God gave him the law. Um, then when Moses was fasting and praying for Israel because they had rebelled against God, Deuteronomy 9, 18, it says, Then once again I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had committed doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and so provoking him to anger. Again, in chapter 9, verse 25, he says, I lay prostrate before the Lord those 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord had said he would destroy you and then when Moses sent the spies into Canaan in Numbers 13, 25, it says, At the end of 40 days they returned from exploring the land. Deuteronomy 8, chapter 8, verse 2 through 5 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert those 40 years to humble you and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Judges 13, 1 says, After the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And then this is where Goliath shows up. 1 Samuel 17, 16 says, For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 8 says, So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And this is about Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verse 13 says he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. Then after his resurrection, Acts chapter 1, verse 3 says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. 40 is a really important number. Our youth and I, we've, we've been talking over the last several weeks about some of their classmates that they go to, to school with and how some of them don't believe in God and they want proof. Um, this is historical, folks. I, I don't know if you know that, but this is not just made-up stories. This is history, verified by hundreds of people. Jesus was seen by over 500 people alive after he was resurrected. I mean, how many people does it take to tell you I'm alive? 500 people or more saw him alive. That's proof enough, and it's written in the books. And not only that, he wasn't just alive for a few minutes. He walked around with them for 40 days, eating and drinking and talking and teaching more. So it's historical proof. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is, my, is the story of Jonah. You can turn there if you want to, but 
I love the story of Jonah. It's one of those stories that, anybody ever seen the VeggieTales version of Jonah? Yeah. Don't you love that movie? I think it's the best VeggieTales movie ever. I can just watch it by myself. I don't need my grandkids there to watch it. J Jonah was sent by God to Nineveh. We know that. Here's what you may not know. Nineveh was world famous for being cruel. Extraordinarily cruel, and vicious, and violent, even to their own people. They were known worldwide for being the experts of skinning someone alive and keeping them alive the longest. They would torture adults for days and days and days before finally they just die. They were the most violent nation in the world at the time. And it wasn't just one or two people. It was the entire city of Nineveh. And so Jonah is sent by God to this city that was known to burn their boys and girls alive, cut their heads off and skin people alive. And God says, I want you to go to them and give them the message I've given you. And Jonah, like many of us, kind of said, I don't know if you know this, God, but they're bad people. They'll kill me. And so I'm not going to do that. And you know the story, I'm sure. Jonah got on a boat, went as far away from Nineveh, basically as far away from God as he possibly could. He went in the complete opposite direction. God sends, you know, a storm on the sea, and they throw him overboard. Big fish swallows him. You know, people can't handle that, whatever. Jesus verified this story, by the way, and if Jesus verifies it, I just go with him. So if Jesus said it was true, I, I just believe it was true, too. I think he probably knows whether it was true or not. So finally, Jonah repents, of course. He's in the belly of a fish. Of course he's going to pray and repent. Spit, spits him up on the land. Once again, the word of, the God, of God comes to Jonah. Go to Nineveh. Give them the word I gave you to give them. Not a new message. Same message I gave you. Listen, until you give the message that God gave you, he won't move on to something else. Amen. I'm just telling you. He's very patient. If God's told you to do something, you haven't done it, and you're thinking he's just going to move on to something else, I got bad news for you. He's not going to do it. Every time you say, Lord, I need you, he's going to say, yeah, remember that first message I gave you? When you do that, we'll talk about the next thing. That's just, just the way I, I've seen it work in my life. So anyway, so finally, Jonah goes to, Nona, to Nineveh. Now, I believe, and this is my opinion, that Jonah was very scared. He had every right to be. They were vicious people. But I also think something in Jonah, and the scripture would back this up, made him think, you know, they deserve to be destroyed. They, they don't deserve forgiveness, God. Do you, they're so wicked, they deserve your wrath. They deserve your judgment. They deserve your punishment. And so he, I think he thought, you know, if I don't go, you'll punish them, which is what they deserve. And we know we deserve it too. But God didn't see it that way. But my question is for you, for our community, for the, the world that you live in, your circle, that maybe to you seems beyond reach of God, extremely wicked and immoral. Our, our nation, we could say our nation seems to be going that way. The world seems to be going that way. And we could say they deserve God's wrath and God's judgment. And you would be exactly right. They do. They deserve his wrath. They deserve his judgment. They deserve his punishment. So if you're put in that place to God sends you to them, what would you do? Would you do it knowing they may possibly kill you? They may possibly, you know, torture you. We have a hard time sometimes just going to people that would make fun of us or just roll their eyes at us because we speak about Jesus. And that challenges us sometimes. But this is a whole other story. What would you do for those that you love? Would you speak to them about the Lord? Would you tell them about what God's done in your life? Would you tell them how the things you know about God and and that he is alive, and Jesus is not just a, a, a good made-up story? Sure you would. What would you do to see miracles happen in church, in your family? We have family members that are lost, as lost can be. And I just got to tell you, I'd do anything for them. I, w I mean, 
I would die for them. I would. If it meant, and Donna and I have talked about this, if my death meant bringing them to Jesus, and I, I knew that, I would absolutely die for them because I love them because I know where I'm going. And I know where they're going at this moment. And if, and if my death meant they would come to know him, I would gladly do that. But what would you do to see miracles happen in your family? What about in your schools? What about on your job? What about in this community? Let's, let's talk, narrow it down a little bit to, to Pickens County. Some of you live in, in uh, Gilmer County and Cherokee County. Let's, let's look at these three areas that most of us live in. What would you do for this community, our, our three county area, to come to Jesus Christ? Would you do anything? Would you give up your money? Would you sacrifice your time? Would you open up your home for a Bible study? Would you, would you spend an extra two or three hours a day studying your Bible and praying? Would you fast? Would you give up something if, it, if you knew that it meant God would pour His Spirit out in our area? So with Jonah, all we know that Jonah did was this scripture. Chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Jonah entered the city and walked for one day, and he preached to the people saying, after 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. All we know, that's all we know that Jonah said. We don't know by the scripture. He might have said more, but what if he just walked around saying, after 40 days, Nineveh's going to be destroyed. Oh, by the way, after 40 days, Nineveh's going to be destroyed. Nineveh's going to be destroyed. Nineveh's going to be destroyed. Nineveh's going to be destroyed after 40 days. And then he just, okay, God, I did what you did, what you said. That could possibly be all the words that came out of his mouth. And the scripture says that they believed him. And they repented and put on sackcloth and ashes, which was an a exhibit of their, their mourning and their repentance. Even the king of Nineveh said, don't let any animal or person eat or drink water. And let's all go into mourning. And who knows Maybe God will relent. And you know what happened? God relented. He didn't destroy them. The biggest miracle the world's ever known, an entire city came to know Jesus, came to know God. Jesus wasn't around then. Came to know God, repented, and turned to the God of the Bible based on this one man's obedience, even in his fear. He did what he said, what God told him to do, and the entire town changed because of him. Is that possible again? Is it possible that God could change an entire country? What about our United States of America? Is it possible, or is it too far gone? I think sometimes we think it's too far gone. Is it possible that you guys had that video that I asked you about? Okay, can you play that video? I have a 10-second video for you. I want you to see. Real quick, you're going to have to listen to the words. I played this the other night. Okay, go ahead. We will make it right. You and I can hurt them. But you will tear them apart from the inside. Okay, anybody know what that's from? What? Avengers Age Voltron. Okay, thanks. I didn't hardly have anybody the other night that knew what that was. Now, I'm so excited that I'm able to use an Avengers clip in my sermon. I, I, I just feel like now I could just die and go to heaven. My life has accomplished, you know, I just feel so, so good about that. What's the spiritual aspect of this? The spiritual aspect is what, if you don't know about the movie, Ultron is an artificial intelligent being, and he is trying to destroy the Avengers, and he figures out the way to destroy them the best is to destroy them from the inside out. Right. And this, this little woman he's talking to is kind of a witch or whatever, and she can change their mind and make them think that what they're seeing is true when it's really not. The spiritual aspect is, is that our enemy, if you're a follower of Christ, you have an enemy, will do the exact same thing with us. He would love to come in and tell you, look, what Mark's trying to do, it's stupid. You shouldn't worry about it. What he's, you know, it's not right. It's not going to help anything. You just need to keep doing what you're doing. That's what the enemy would do. But listen, if we can be unified, 
If we can come together. Remember what happened after Jesus was resurrected, after he went back into heaven, and he told them, go and wait on the Holy Spirit. And what happened? They came to the upper room, and they were what? In one accord. Which meant they were all together in mind, not just in body. They weren't just in the same place. They were praying the same. They were thinking the same. They were talking the same thing. When one spoke a language, the others were saying the same thing. And listen, as a church, all of our churches, if we can get together, if we can become unified once and for all, miracles can happen that we've never seen before. God can pour out His Spirit greater than He ever has. The prophet Joel says, In the last days I will pour out my Spirit on everyone, the young and the old, the men and the women, the boys and the girls, to where miracles will happen. And listen, the key to it is unity, people. We've got to be in one accord. We have to. And all in our churches, we've got to quit fighting. We've got to quit worrying about, you know, and I've told people, listen, if this church is not for you, I can recommend a good church for you. Just go to church somewhere. Go somewhere where the Bible's preaching, where they'll love you and you can grow because you need it. You can't do it on your own. But you don't have to come here, but you need to go somewhere. But we got to be in unity. And when we are, if we're praying the same, listen, if we're praying the same and for the same goal and for the same things for six weeks, I can't wait to see what God would do. I can't wait to see what He would do in this place and in our community. I believe you guys would come back and say, God, i got to tell you what happened in my family. i got to tell you what happened in the restaurant the other day. We were just talking and this waitress got saved right there talking to us. It's a miracle. And then she'd come back and say, listen, I went home and talked to my kids and they got saved. And then on and on and on. And that's where revival happens. Why 40? Well, here's our announcement. I told you for weeks we got a big campaign announcement. Here's the big campaign announcement. Nothing political. It's a 40-day campaign of awakening. 40 days. 40 days of awakening. Now, the only thing as pastor of this church and our leadership and prayer team and all our folks that have kind of gotten on the same page with this already, all we can do is do what we can do. I can't make you do anything. I can't. I can only control what I do. I can't even make my wife do anything. I can only control what I do. She can't make me do anything. Well, most of the time. Sometimes she can't. But most of the time, I do what I want to do. And I can't make you do anything. But I am telling you, if you will commit to a 40-day campaign of awakening, and we come together as a church and as church community, we'll see miracles happen. Do you know that for every 40, there's a 41 in Scripture? Did you know that? When God said, when when the, let me go back to some of these Scriptures. You don't have to, Steve. But when the rain fell on the earth, you know what happened on the 41st day? Rain stopped. When Moses had fled Egypt and he was wandering around and kind of rebelling from God, not doing what God did, you know that Scripture says that after 40 years, an angel appeared to him, changed his life. Then when he went on the mountain, stayed for 40 days, you know what happened? He came back glowing (laughs) and with the law of God that has changed us forever and ever. Time and time again, the spies went into Canaan and after 40 days, they saw the land was what God said for them. Jesus was tempted by Satan for 40 days. For 40 days tempted, hungry. What happened at 41? Angels attended to him. And his ministry began that still changed the world today. After every 40, there's a 41. And I'll just tell you, I'm already so looking to 41, I can't hardly stand it. I want to get on with it. Because I believe when we come together for 40 days, miracles are going to happen. So what does that mean for us? We're going to focus on some key things, a lot of things, but some very key things for the next 40 days. First is scripture reading. We're going to focus on the Word of God. We talk about the Word of God here a lot. We, 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 you hear me talk about it. You hear Gerald talk about it. Other people that, that preach here, we are known as Living Word Church because we believe it is a living word. We believe all our life comes from this Word. All of the directions we need, everything we need comes from there. We're going to focus on prayer. We're going to focus on magnifying God and worship. 
We're going to focus on love and action. Not just saying we love, but we're going to show it. And forgiveness and thanksgiving and many more. Some very key things. And we're going to, our attention is going to be focused week to week on certain things. The campaign starts this Tuesday, October the 13th, and will end on November the 21st, which is a Saturday. And then on the 22nd, which is our 41st day, we're going to come in here and expect that God's going to blow the roof off of this place. And we're going to hear testimonies of what God's done for 40 days in your life, in my life, and in our church, and in our, in our community. We may not stop there. I hope we don't. I really hope we don't. So what is your part of this challenge? I'm challenging you to read Scripture every day. Very easy, two minutes a day. And then you add one minute every day. Some of you already do more than that. I get it. I'm not saying back off to two minutes. But some of you don't read your Scripture at all. You don't read your Bible at all. And I'm telling you, if, if every person in every seat in here, and those that will watch, I know some will come back and watch the, the sermon on, on Monday. If all of us commit to reading our Bibles every day, two minutes a day, add a minute every day, you can do that. You spend three minutes doing something worthless. You can read the Bible for three minutes a day. And at the end of the 40 days, you'll be up over 45 minutes a day reading the Scripture. But here's the thing. God's Word is living and active. It's like a double-edged sword. It will do what He sent it out to do. If you want your life to change, I'm telling you, this is not a, not a bait and switch thing. I'm not trying to sell you anything. But if you would commit to reading God's Word for 40 days like this, I promise you, you'll see Him move in your life at the end of 40 days. I promise you. God promises you. In prayer, I want you to start making a list now of people you need to pray for. Some of you are not list makers. I'm not. Honestly, I'm not a list maker. So it's going to be a challenge for me to make a list of people that I need to pray for. I know who's going to be at the top of my list, my children. I know that, that need Jesus. You guys, some of you guys are going to be on my list, other people that I know. And whenever I, I find of a need, I'm going to put it on my list, and I'm going to pray for those people every day. And you need to do that. Parents, let me tell you something. Especially you guys that have kids that are young and uh, even very young or not married yet. Pray for your children daily. Pray with your spouse for your children. Pray with them. You have, to, you have to come together. Mommies and daddies, you have to come together. You might say, oh, we've never done that before. It makes me nervous. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I don't know what to say. It doesn't matter. You just, don't you love your kids? Don't you want the best for them? God bless my children. Protect them from temptation. Give them strength. Let them have a hunger for your word. Let them want you more than they want anything else. That's an easy prayer for them. You can say that. Write it down if you don't know what to say. Write it down. You know, it doesn't matter. God knows your heart. If you have to write it down and just read it word for word and stop, that's okay. God knows your heart. And pray for their future spouse. And you're thinking, listen, Mark, I got a four-year-old, okay? I just want them to quit doing what they're doing in their room right now. I'm not even thinking about a spouse. Let me tell you something. If you're not praying for their spouse, who do you think is? Nobody. And you need to do that. I, I'm telling you, as a, as a man with three grown children and four grandbabies, you need to be praying for your, skid, your kid's future spouse now. Pray for those girls that they, they have a godly man come into their life and keep all the losers away from them. And you can pray that. It's okay. It's biblical to say loser. It's, it's quite all right. Pray that God would send them a godly man that loves God more than they love him because if, they, if this man doesn't love God, he can't love them. Pray for your boys that, that he would send them a pure girl, a pure young woman that has to get through God to get to him. That's the way you need to pray for your kids. You pray for them. And all your lost ones, you, your family members, you need to pray for them. Make a list. Pray for our leaders of our country and our church leaders as well. Listen, you have a church somewhere else, pray for your pastor. You need to be praying for your pastor and all the church leadership. You need to pray that God grows your church, grows that church, and makes it a, a healthy church. And then also, I'm going to give you weekly emails. I need your emails. If you have not been getting emails from us, from me, 
There's a list on the back table back there. Please, please, please put your email on there. If you don't, even if you don't go to church here, but you want to get our emails, please put your email on there. And weekly, possibly, I'm, I'm hoping daily, I'm going to send out some kind of devotional or scripture or something daily. But weekly, I'm going to give you a memory verse. And this is for the whole church. This is for all of the adults, the teenagers. They didn't know it. They're going to be involved in this too. Um, and all our kids too. They're all, all of you are going to get the same scripture verse every week. We're going to be on the same page one way or another. And then we're going to see miracles happen. I have an amazing team of young men and young women. I'm going to ask them to come to the front. You guys that I asked to help me this morning. That's your, that's your cue. Come to the front. And they're going to hand you out a couple of pieces of paper. These guys are God's new army, in case you didn't know it. Yeah. Um, they are. So here, here's what they're going to do. They're going to give you... Let me have one, and then you guys can take those. They're going to give you this Bible reading plan. Every person is going to get one. Whether you want one or not, you're going to get it. I'm going to ask you to not throw it away. If you don't need it, like my wife is one, she doesn't need this. Give it to somebody else, okay? Give it to somebody. If you say, I don't need a list, I read my Bible every day, and I, I know how to, that's fine. Give it to somebody else. Somebody else needs this. They're also going to give you this scripture, which is our scripture of the day. Don't, don't go there yet, Steve. But it's Psalm 127, 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. They're going to give every one of you, from the youngest to the oldest, one of those things. Why do you need to read Scripture? We kind of think, well, duh, we're Christians. We, we're supposed to read Scripture. Don't get too far into the... Stay with me here for a minute. We're about to close. If you guys want to come on up, Tim. Why is it so important that you read Scripture? Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Now I know we've got people walking around, so some of you are kind of lost. What? Hey, guys in the back didn't get a list. Y'all take care of them. Come on, guys. Did anybody else not get a list? Everybody needs to get one. Okay. This scripture, do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. That doesn't mean just read it and then set it down. That means you need to keep it in you at all times because there's going to come a time when you need it and you won't have a Bible in your hands. And there's the promise from God says that then, then, not until. Listen, when you hear the then in scripture... Think of this, not until you do that thing. I want, I want you to focus on me just for a minute. Guys, look this way for just a minute. When God says then, he means not until you meditate on Scripture will you be successful and prosperous. So when you do it, when you stay with Scripture and you meditate on it and you get it deep down inside of you, then you will be prosperous and successful. And then our memory verse, Psalm 127, 1, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. He's going to do this, not us. We've got to focus on God. That God's the one that will do the miracles. God's the one that will do the savings. He's the one that will do the physical healing. He's the one that will, will have miracles happen. Your lost ones that you wish would come to know Jesus, He's the one that will save them, not you, not me. He will do it, and only He will do it. We just have to be in obedient and in unity. Can you imagine what will happen if we come together and do this for 40 days? Just 40 short days. Can you imagine what might happen in our community? Here's what I think will happen. This is the goal that I believe the Lord gave us as a church. Not 25 salvations, 250 salvations. 500 baptized new believers. 200% increased church attendance. 
200 that will start, take up their call, serving in ministry. 20 new missions projects and 20 new small groups focused on Bible study and prayer. Now, what does that sound like to you? That sounds like a miracle, doesn't it? That sounds like something only God can do. And I'm telling you, we need to have a God-sized vision. We need to think so big that if, if, if it's going to happen, God will have to do it. See, I could possibly witness to 25 people in six weeks and, and let them be saved, and I could say, I did that. But 250, there's no way. God will have to do it. This is a God-sized vision, and I promise you, everything else will pale in comparison after 40 days if you will just buy into this. Start Tuesday reading your Scripture. Start tonight praying. Fasting, we're going to have extra times of prayer in here. We're going to open up the church on different days for prayer and communion. We're going to have extra nights of worship during this 40 days. We're going, to, we're going to focus on seeking God like we never have before and expect that He's going to show up. And you other guys, we're going to pray for you guys. We're going to pray for every church in our community. Faithfully, not just once, but faithfully for 40 days that God will show up in your midst and do miracles in your churches. And if you're in unity with that, I'd like to ask you to stand. And the altars are going to be open. And I'd just like to ask you, if you would commit to this, God will do miracles in your life. And this is not, I'm not trying to manipulate you. I just want you to get real with Jesus, just for a moment, right now. Don't worry about all the other stuff. Don't worry about what we're going to do later. Don't worry about anything else, but for right now, Focus on your relationship with Jesus. Do you have one? Do you even know him? If today were the day that God said it's your last day, would you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you would be in heaven with him? You can know today. I'm going to ask our guys that are serving on the prayer team to come to the front. If you need prayer, there'll be people up front that will pray with you face to face. If you just want time in the altar with God, come spend time with him. Father, we thank you that you're a loving God, that you care about us, and you haven't forsaken us. And God, we need this time with you. And Father, as we commit to seek you for the next 40 days, we believe that you'll do miracles in our churches, in our families. You'll restore marriages. You'll heal father and son and mother and daughter relationships, parents and children. God, you'll do miracles in our school that you'll save people throughout our county that our county will change. Our three-county area will we'll see a revival and awakening that we've never seen before. And we in advance, God, give you glory for that. You'll do it. We can't do it. And so we rely on you. We trust you now, God, to do that. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. To, to Canton and beyond. God, that everywhere we go, that fire would spread as well, God. And then we would just be a match in your hand, God. Just a small little ember that would set a fire like this world's never seen. Use us, God. Give us a hunger for your word and for your presence, God, like we've never had before. You are the author of life. Without you, we have no life. But with you, we have abundant life. And we expect miracles, God, not for our glory, but... Only for your glory, Jesus. For your kingdom, God. We have no kingdom. That the kingdom of God would be magnified and, and built and expanded. And that all of our churches would see revival, God. That home groups would break out in revival, God. Not for any glory, but yours, God. And we don't care. We don't care if Channel 5 News shows up or not. It doesn't matter. We need you to show up, Jesus. We need you to show up in our lives and in our kids' lives. Save them, Father. Set them on fire for you. Let them know that they need you. And we thank you in advance for what you're about to do in our community and throughout this world. God, we pray for the Cowboy Church this morning that you would bless them, that you would continue to use them Set them on fire for you, God. Send them the people that they need to help them, Lord, the resources that they need and the workers that they need. Father, to do the vision that you've given them to do in this community. 
Father, I pray for the Word Church, for their pastor and their leaders, for Sam and Carla, God, that you would bless them and give them wisdom, that you would provide for them everything they need, protect them from the enemy, Lord. And Satan, you have no power over God's body. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I pray for this, this worship group, eight days after, Tim and his guys and their families, Lord, that you would open up doors for them to minister your gospel like they've never seen before. That it would be exponential, that they would get calls and requests to, to do things that they just know is you opening those doors. Not because of their talent or anything else, but simply because you, Jesus, are for them. We ask you to bless them and use them, that lives would be changed because of their ministry. We bless you this morning, Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for our 16 ladies that are serving this weekend in other areas, that they would come back on fire for you as well. And that we just be in one accord in unity as your church across this world. And we look forward to your soon coming, Jesus. We want to be about your business, so show us how to do that. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name that we pray. And the church said, amen, amen. God bless you. Hug somebody before you get out of here. Please, please help these guys out. Pick up all their stuff before you get out of here, okay? God bless you. Love you guys.